From the BBC World Service, welcome to the latest edition of the Documentary Podcast. Every week we bring you a range of stories from our presenters and reporters across the world. Please do rate the documentary on your podcast app and leave a comment. Let us know what you think. Police of the state against Nelson Mandela and nine others. With these words, the Ravonia trial began in earnest. It was December 1963, and in South Africa's Supreme Court in Pretoria, Nelson Mandela and his co-accused faced a possible death sentence for opposing the country's white minority rule. I'm Gavin Fisher, a South African journalist, and I have a strong personal link to the trial. Lord, I appear for the accused with Malaya. The voice you hear now is my great uncle, Bram Fisher, who led the defence and played a big part in saving Mandela's life. But Bram's role in the trial could have been so very different. As well as a lawyer, he was heavily involved in the anti apartheid movement and could easily himself have been put in the dock at the Ravonia trial. He was later jailed for this work and died in prison in 1975 before I was born. So gaining exclusive access to these trial recordings for the BBC World Service, I've had my first chance to hear him speak. I've just been made aware of what appears to be a most extraordinary and unheard of procedure. Here, he's objecting to a planned radio broadcast of the prosecution's opening address. That it might be, <coughs> without your lordship's consent, contempt of court and gravely prejudicial. You can understand his concern. There were certainly no plans to broadcast his opening address for the defence. The judge, Justice Devet, stopped the broadcast. So of the next six months of the trial, only one audio record remains, these tapes. I've been instructed, my lord, that the wire leads... Now, over 60 years later, the recordings have been digitised, making the words they hold available in their entirety for the first time since they were uttered in court. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. This is Nelson Mandela speaking from the dock. His speech has long endured as a symbol of power, of bravery and of sacrifice in the face of the evil of apartheid. If it needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Mandela has become the focal point of the Ravonia trial. But listening to the newly available recordings would also stand out as smaller moments of defiance, of tragedy and of hope unheard until now. Behind each lies the story of someone swept up in the shockwaves of a trial that changed a nation. Hello, Hello. <laughs> Elizabeth, Hi. Gavin yeah. Fisher from the BBC. OK, Hi. I'm Elizabeth Madhavani. How are you? I'm fine, thank nice you. Nice to see you, nice to see you. <laughs> Elizabeth Mashafane was one of those people affected. We're in the Johannesburg suburb of Ravonia at Lilliesley Farm, where as a young girl, Elizabeth stayed with her father and brother, where the men worked as labourers. It must, uh, it must look very different now than it did. Yes, <laughs> quite different. Was, this place was bushy, full of trees, uh, wild birds, even this tortoise. They used to just walk around. Ravonia is now an affluent, built-up suburb. But in the early 1960s, the area was open farmland. The workers grew sweet corn and fruit. But unbeknownst to them, the farm also harboured a secret... It was a hideout and meeting place for top members of the apartheid resistance, including Nelson Mandela. So this one, this one, is our, my father, Thomas. Lily's Leaf is now a heritage centre and a photo of Elizabeth's relatives hangs in one of the outbuildings. This one is my well, elder brother. So looking at the, the picture in front of us of your, your brother and your father, what's the... What's the emotions? What do you feel looking at Ooh, it? I feel very much sad because it takes me back to that day of the raid because it was something that we couldn't uh, forget. That day was the 11th of July, 1963, when police stormed the farm, rounding up not only anti-apartheid activists who were meeting there, but also taking the farm workers. They were pulling them, pushing them, and then we also witnessed our father being dragged and then from the left ear she was having bleeding it was not a nice thing to see the repercussions of the raid were great it dealt a heavy blow to the fight against apartheid in south africa 
with the arrests leading to the Ravonia trial. For the farm workers, it was the start of an ordeal which would change their lives forever. Detained by police before the trial, they were subjected to violence and threats to try and elicit information, before being put on the witness stand as part of the case against Mandela and his co-accused. We may not have known the full extent of this treatment were it not for Elizabeth's father, Thomas. He finished his testimony by forcing the court to hear what the police had done. Elizabeth never went to court and had never heard that testimony until I was able to play it to her. When my statement was taken... You can hear Thomas in the background, his words translated into English. They told me to undress. I did undress. They then were in a group there and they told me to run round the table. And each one that I passed either kicked me or struck me with a fist. As she listens to her father's voice, the quiet power which Elizabeth exudes seems to drain from her. I just want to know, my lord, why I should be assaulted like that when I was not uh, committing any offence. Mm. I can hear him. He's our father. It's very painful in my heart. It's really hitting me. It's not a nice thing to listen. <sighs> The memories comes back as if it happens yesterday or last night. Hey. You must be proud that he spoke up at the trial. Mm. Hey, he, he, he spoke up, but did it help anything? Mm. Because it didn't make any difference. They were not treated like humans. Not even a single one was treated like humans. If you just hold that, it'll it'll come out of there, so you should be able to hear it. Great. At 19 years old, Twadi McKenna was the youngest of the farm workers to take the stand at the Ravonia trial, and the only one left alive today. I visited him at his home in the small rural village of Pakwane in the Limpopo province of South Africa, so he could hear some of his testimony. <laughs> A slight, humble man, Twadi's face lights up on hearing the tape. I feel very, very excited to hear my voice after so many years. It's just so amazing. I can't believe it. As the most junior labourer, Twadi didn't face the kind of beatings Thomas Mashafane did, yet he still couldn't avoid the impact of Ravonia. It was my first experience as an employee uh, from the rural areas. So it was an opportunity for me to buy clothes for myself, better things, uh, so that when I go home, um, I can be proud, my family can be proud of me after that trial. And I never went back, you know, to the cities to work. Looking back, how does it feel to have been part of such a historic trial? When I look back in hindsight, uh, time and again I become nervous even to up to this day. I tend to feel that uh, they might come back and say that uh, some new information has been revealed, you need to come and uh, make some confession. Even though I know I didn't do anything wrong, but I have that fear that something might just come up and then they might want to reopen, you know, the, the investigations. That fear has always been there. And uh, despite the fact that, you know, the trial ended many, many years ago. This idea may seem odd over 60 years on, but as a group, these farm workers were hounded by police, some of them even after the trial. Both Elizabeth and Twadi told me their families kept their ordeals a secret as far as possible, scared the visits from police would have them labelled criminals. It's a mindset that is hard to shake. But what of the mindset of the police? Donald John Card. PARD. 
right from the beginning, I disagreed with apartheid. But of course, apartheid only came into being in 1948. In 1947, I joined the police force and I took an oath and my oath was law and order. Donald Card is now 89 years old, but his physical presence is undimmed by age. When talking about the idea of an anti-apartheid revolution in the 1950s and 60s, he still seethes with anger. A revolution would have left this country in ashes. I, I, I was prepared to do anything to stop that revolution. Look, I wasn't innocent. I had problems. When I arrested people, they just say, you are an apartheid policeman, you've got no right to arrest me. And I'll say, I'll show you the rights. And I used to, I used to get stuck into them because it, it, it was going to be a fight and I had to win. Donald was not involved in the interrogation of the farm workers. But after the end of apartheid, his name was linked to accusations of torture and the beating of suspects. He denies them. South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, set up to hear testimony of apartheid-era crimes, made no formal conclusion on his guilt. There are nine names that mentioned my name in the uh, Truth Commission. Four of those people I've never seen in my life, and I can swear to God that I've never seen them. They knew who I was and how I broke up different people and organisations and that, that I was sort of pointed out. I was serving on the criminal staff, but I dealt with the investigation of um, numerous political matters, including riots at East London, uh, riots in Ponderland and other uh, ANC matters. Detective Card took the stand at the Ravonia trial on the 24th of January 1964, but his involvement started long before. Though he was stationed far from Johannesburg in East London on the country's south coast, one of his contacts in the anti-apartheid movement, Reginald and Dubé, tipped him off about meetings at Ravonia. He took the information straight to the head of the security branch. I told him what Reggie had told me. Then he said to me, when are you going home? I said, I'm going back immediately. So he said, can you stay over a little while? I want you to address people at 2 o'clock. So 2 o'clock, there was all the security from that area, and I had to address them and tell them the story. And it was as a result of that story that... The police up there were aware that there was something on the go. This information and his work in East London made Donald a key state witness at Ravonia. I remember taking the stand. I was looking at all strange faces. During the cross-examination, they, they cross-examined me about a whole lot of things. And I actually slipped up. I said all the people from East London, the 72, were ANC members. And these members, what are their political affiliations? They are all members of the ANC. All members of the ANC. And Bramfisher grabbed, grabbed onto that. Now, you said these were all members of the ANC. That is correct. How do you know that? Well, um, firstly... I hadn't recorded a word. Now I'm sitting, I'm, and the oath said the these people were ANC members. Bram started... Number so-and-so, how did you know he was a member? If you just go through them quickly. Five. You want to know about number five? Yeah. Um, well, I should think back. Now, where did I arrest him? How did I arrest him? What is the story? Oh, yeah, OK. He had a Mandela badge. And number six? They didn't go through all 72, but they went through, he, um, Brahm went through a whole lot of them. Occasion, number eight. An old member. After the case... Ron Fisher came up to me, shook my hand, and he said to me, how did you remember? And, you know, Brom, from that day, at 11 o'clock when we went for tea, Brom would say, won't you come and have tea with me? He'd never talk anything about the case, and we became very friendly. I, I found Brom a, a very interesting man. Obviously, my great-uncle was, at the time, not only leading the defence, but also a big part of the Communist Party and, and associated with the ANC, and you were on opposite sides. In a sense, you were even enemies, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Look, I always said I was against apartheid. Our job was to make sure that there was law and order. So when I gave evidence against Nelson Mandela and these people, it was the criminal side that was, that was important. What I do feel is that we... At least we saved South Africa. That, that's my view. You know, I see these people, 
or kill people at that time, are now buried in Hero's Acre. They're heroes. Some of the things that we did was something that somebody could at least say, hell, oh, well, well done. There's still the scars in our psyches of both the, those who were oppressed and diminished and those who were diminished by being the oppressor. Dennis Goldberg was the only white person sentenced to life imprisonment at Ravonia and one of only two surviving trialists. He says too many white people were willing to be shielded by the privileges of apartheid. And for people like activists like Brahm among the whites and me and many others, hundreds, who were opposed to apartheid said not to oppose it is to be part of it because of the privilege. Should we have a listen to a little bit of your testimony? Yeah, I think you yeah. were speaking about that. I think, Mr Goldberg, in this country there are many people who don't approve of these mixed attendances. A large majority of the whites feel this way. Uh, a large majority of the whites feel that way. What is your opinion of people who feel that way? I think they're bigoted. I think they're narrow-minded and intolerant. Really, I went into the witness box in the hope of trying to explain why it was necessary for somebody like me, for a white, to consciously oppose the regime. I, I've always believed that I, that's what I did, and I realised that my imagination wasn't playing tricks with me. You know, how one thinks in the situation, I said that, but you thought you said it. But I actually did say it, and I'm so relieved I said it. <laughs> so does it feel good hearing that clip? I do like it very much, and thanks for playing it for me. <laughs> Dennis is 84 years old and saw me when he was ill with lung cancer. You'd barely know. His lined face still shines with enthusiasm and wit. There is, though, one topic we discuss to which this wit isn't applied. His time spent in jail with my great-uncle. Brahm was born into a rich, influential Afrikaner family, but he chose to fight the apartheid system that would have embraced him and, in 1966, was imprisoned for this work. We moved back to our old prison and so we saw Brahm and said, Hello, Brahm, how are you? And he said, Shh, they don't like us to talk. And then we heard that Brahm would be made to clean toilets with a toothbrush. Anything to try and humiliate Brahm. For them, Brahm was the ultimate traitor. Brahm was the Afrikaner who could have been prime minister, president, anything. And he turned against his own people. So they hated him, literally hated him. Brahm's ill treatment continued even after he got cancer. Without proper care, it was Dennis who took up the task of looking after him before he died. In the end, he was so light I could pick him up out of bed and put him on a toilet. We battled to get him looked after properly. The lack of compassion, the lack of... Uh, I find it hard to talk about him. Um, there are few, there are a lot of comrades for whom I had the greatest respect. There are one or two who I can say were my best friends as well as comrades. And for Brahm, I can say I loved him. He was such an influence on all of us, such a hero. The closure takes years and years and years. There's a closeness and a bond uh, yeah, closeness and a bond. And I'm so glad that this relationship that you have through your family with him leads you to make this documentary. Thanks for asking me to talk. Thank you. It's, it's a privilege for me. May I please, Your Lordship? Lord, Your Lordship will have realised from the cross-examination of the state witnesses... Listening to the tapes, hearing Brahm in court, I'm able to transport myself back to a time 
before my great uncle's life was swept by tragedy. Your lordship will also have realised from the cross-examination that there are certain equally important parts of that evidence which will be denied and which we shall maintain are false. Calm, deliberate, almost gentle at times, in his voice I find some sense of a man whose dedication and total sacrifice I've always tried to fully comprehend. Which I think was properly to be stated by the defence. It is clear Brahms' quiet moral authority and fierce intelligence helped avoid the death penalty for the accused. But while life imprisonment was seen as a victory for the defence, it was far from the end of the suffering for those impacted by Ravonia. People think that uh, the only people that suffered is only those Ravonia trialists. But let me tell you, the families themselves also suffered. Kokoi Motsaledi is the son of Elias Motsaledi, one of those imprisoned at the Ravonia trial. I was the youngest in the family. I was born two months after he was arrested. Being without a father, the poverty in the family was obvious to everyone. When I first learned that my father was in Cape Town, I didn't know that he was in prison. And I had to write him a, re- a letter. I remember I wrote him, I asked him why is he staying there in Cape Town, leaving us to suffer here without, without him. Kokoi is just one of Elias's family members who've gathered for their first chance to hear him speaking from the dock. My lord, I'm 39 years old and formerly lived at Orlando West, Johannesburg. We're in Elias's old house, and below a picture of him on the wall, his family sit in silent reverie, hooked on his voice. I did what I did because I wanted to help my people in their struggle for equal rights. I felt very strongly about the laws which discriminated against my people and which caused poverty, ill health and misery for which they suffer. Well, look, this is awesome for us, because we haven't heard this before. Aaron Mozzoledi is Elias' nephew. We know his voice, I know his voice, uh, but we only know his voice in old age, when he was released. We think think back and we wish he was still here. We are very grateful uh, that you brought this to us to hear, because I never thought I'll ever get to hear what he said. I was under the impression that only... Mandela's speech was taped and any other of the Rivonia trialists, we are never to hear what he's saying. I'm sure the country will be very interested to hear this. Aaron is now South Africa's Minister of Health, something he knows would have been impossible if it weren't for people like his uncle. All those positions, I believe I, I had the ability, the capacity to hold them through their sacrifice. He died on the day that, that Nelson Mandela was inaugurated. <laughs> Um, after after quite a long illness, this feels like there's more than just coincidence there. Hey, yeah, that that was a, the manner in which it happened. We went to the union building when Mandela was inaugurated. You know, it was a miracle and an excitement. And immediately when we dispersed, the old man passed on. You know, it 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 just felt like he wanted to make sure. That indeed what he has been fighting for, what he went to jail for, definitely happens and he wants to know about it before he departs. You can't help and believe that he did indeed hold on just for that. And, and after it happened, he said, now I can rest in peace. Ravonia is often referred to as the trial that changed a nation. As without it, Nelson Mandela may never have become the president of a democratic, multiracial South Africa. The trial is so historically significant it's easy to forget the myriad lives which it affected. Since he has been to prison, he changed very dramatically because... Elizabeth Mashafane's father, Thomas, was scarred for life by his experience in police custody. Physically, he never regained his hearing in one ear and emotionally, Elizabeth says, he could barely discuss his ordeal and was haunted by it until his death in 2006. But somehow, he did find some hope in it all. He changed to be a priest because uh, he just 
felt that he, she, he must at least thank God that he came home being alive. Have you managed to forgive them? Uh, we are just um, we are, we try to to forgive because it has happened. It has happened. You, they cannot undo what they have done. So the only thing, as a Christian, you must just forgive others who do bad on you. Listening to Elizabeth speak about her father, the importance of remembering Ravonia and the opportunity these tapes provide is all the clearer. Listening to Thomas's voice, hearing his daughter tell his story, I'm better able to comprehend the dehumanising injustice of the time. And as long as such injustice continues in the modern day, it's clear the stories of people like Thomas Mashafane, who live, suffer and hope for a better future, must be told. My father was a, a strong man and he, he was very much loving. She loved us. When we were here, he was the one who was doing our laundry, doing the ironing, also cooking for us. He was a happy man. He used to like dancing and singing, talking jokes, and then we would laugh. It's good to remember him in that way. Yes. You can easily forget, especially if there's no other person who knows about the story. Everybody might not know about what has happened, but if there is something to to show, it's much better. You've been listening to Remembering Ravonia with me, Gavin Fisher, from the BBC World Service. Huge thanks to my producer, Penny Dale, and to the French Institute of South Africa for their research help. Thanks for listening. We'll have more.